Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first in our series of this term's Fashion Means Business uh, Fashion Talks. Um, it's with great pleasure that I welcome today Mark Pilkington, who is an experienced retail chief executive and strategy consultant who has a wealth of fashion retail experience. He started his career at Courtauld's, later becoming CEO of Gossard and responsible for initiating the huge global success of the Wonder Bra. He then went on to found Supplender.com, the world's first direct-to-consumer e-commerce brand, which was backed by Marks and Spencers, and then went on to become chief executive of the Coach Group, a leading retailer with 850 stores. He has recently published Retail Therapy, Why the Retail Industry is Broken and What Can We Do to Fix It, which was published in 2019 and is in the process of write, writing a second book at the moment, which I will give you a few more details at the end of this talk. The talk today will focus on the retail revolution. In the current COVID pandemic, we are seeing uh, lots of changes. In fact, COVID is acting as a catalyst for change. And in the past year, we have seen a shift from classical retail model towards a new generation retail model. Mark will focus today on the retail revolution and the move of retail away from this classical retail model towards this new generation retail model that he's going to outline. It's with great pleasure that I welcome you, Mark. Thank you very much for joining us today. And um, but there will be time at the end of this talk for questions. Um, and in the meantime, I'm just going to hand over to you, Mark. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hannah. And uh... Uh, hello to all of you uh, listening today. Um, I'm very excited to be with you um, to talk about this retail revolution, as Hannah has described. Um, I think that um, we are all aware that um, we are in the midst of what many people are calling a retail apocalypse. Um, and I guess for people starting out along the journey in the fashion market, that could be a slightly scary prospect, but hopefully we can uh, look at ways to succeed in this new environment. So the main, main driver, of course, is the growth of e-commerce, which has been growing actually pretty dramatically over the last few years and was already causing quite a lot of problems to retail prior to 2020. But as we all know, that was massively accelerated by the lockdowns of COVID um, and um, has now grown to reach over 30% of the UK market, which is, uh, I think, it's about 10 years of uh, growth packed into one year. And in the, in the, as we come out of lockdown and into um, you know, the vaccine and the, recover, you know, the re reopening phase, um, at the moment, there's not that much evidence that it's going to drop dramatically. It seems that new habits have been formed. So I think that we're looking at a, um, a, a new type of world where e-commerce is a very substantial player in the UK. Um, as part of this process, we've seen a huge disruption of incumbent retailers and brands. Um, and the fashion industry, of course, has been probably the worst affected of all the industries, um, with very large numbers of bankruptcies, store closures and, and layoffs. And collectively, as I said earlier, that has been known, has become known as the retail apocalypse. Um, so. Sorry. Um, so let's look at uh, what's happened historically and how retailers and brands are responding to this threat. Um, how should they respond to this threat? Um, I think the first thing to say is not really as if they didn't know about the threat. As Hannah said, I started an e-commerce company back in 2000, and uh, we thought then that we were going to destroy retail in the next few years, which of course didn't happen. Um, but it, is, it really illustrates the point that retail, um, that e-commerce has been around for a long time. And it's not like the retailers didn't know it was happening. And indeed, most of them did try to uh, develop uh, multi-channel online businesses. Um, but in general, they failed. Um, and I think the reason they failed is because they underestimated the, the scale of what was happening. Um, and that is really partly what I want to talk to you about today, that we're not just seeing a few things happening. We're actually seeing a real upending of the whole consumer supply chain that's existed since the Industrial Revolution. Um, and many of them thought in terms of things like, we need to get a website, 
we need to get some online marketing people, uh, we need to uh, go on social media, or we need to employ some technology, or we need to engage uh, with an influencer, um, etc. I um, a, a certain number of specific type of actions, but I think that they never really saw uh, the scale of what was going on. And that's really what I want to talk to you about today. So what does the classical uh, shift to the new generation retailing model involve? In reality, it encompasses a number of important shifts and I want to go through them one by one today. Um, so the first is that it, it was a shift from an oligopolistic uh, uh, set of competitors to what we call in economics theory, perfect competition. I'll explain a bit more later on that. We've moved from a situation of relative consumer ignorance to pretty near to perfect knowledge. We've moved essentially from a, a push system whereby brands and retailers pushed products at relatively passive consumers to closer to a pull system. We're seeing a move from what I call long supply chains to short, much shorter supply chains. Uh, the nature of uh, the uh, relationship between producers and consumers has moved from being pretty much purely transactional to being what I would call relationship based. We're seeing a move from mass marketing to personalized relationships and personalized marketing. We are seeing a move from sales driven processes to more purpose driven brands. Um, we're seeing a move from reliance on stores to multi channel from disintegrated data or complete lack of data to integrated data. We're seeing a change in the definition of products from one set by the four walls of a physical store to what we call the endless aisle of the web. We're seeing a move from big box retailing to uh, new compact stores. Um, in the retail property industry, we're moving from long leases, inflexible leases to more of a plug and play lease model. And as a result, we're move, seeing a move from more permanent stores to more pop-up stores or short-term stores. And then overall, we're seeing um, a move in the high street and in malls from what I'm sure we can all agree uh, historically was quite a boring situation where it was the same 20 or 30 retailers in every high street in the country uh, to a very potentially a really exciting, fast-moving uh, roster of new brands and ideas. And lastly, from a people point of view, we're seeing the move from uh, staff in shops being quite low, low paid and uh, quite administrative to uh, much higher level uh, personal stylists. So those are the, those are the shifts, um, 15 shifts there. And I wanna go through each of them in, in, in more detail, but that just gives you a, a kind of overview of the situation. Um, so I'll just, I'll just go through them one by one, put a bit more sort of flesh on the bones. Um, so uh, the shift one is from oligopoly to competition. Oligopoly is defined as markets dominated by a few players. Now, historically, um, both branding and retailing were very high fixed cost businesses. For brands, it was the cost of their sales forces, the cost of their marketing budgets um, and their infrastructure. For retailers, it was the cost of building the stores. It was the cost of the rents. Um, it was the cost of um, the staff in the stores and of course all the stock in the stores. So they're both very, very high fixed cost businesses. Now, economic theory would indicate that where you have high fixed cost businesses, it creates high barriers to entry because new entrants, new brands and retailers have to have very substantial resources in order to be able to break into these kind of industries. And in fact, it was very, very hard. Um, when I started in business, it was uh, estimated that nine out of 10 new brands failed um, and certainly, you know, if I look back on the industry I first started out in, um, you know, there were five or six big brands and there were probably about 10 retailers and we all knew each other. And although it seemed competitive at the time, looking back on it, it was quite a cosy setup. Uh, we all knew each other. We used to socialize together and uh, uh, it was all very nice. Uh, and the margins were nice and high. And mo most new brands didn't work out. Um, consumers were nervous of, of trying new brands for reasons that we will see a bit later on. Now, to illustrate uh, the, the shift that's happened, um, you know, if I tap my old cat category into Google, I get something like 120 million offerings. So we've gone from 
five or six brands to 120 million. That's the degree of scale of changing competition because moving online and opening an online website is a much less expensive uh, fixed cost business uh, than having brands and stores. It's not necessarily a low variable cost business because the variable costs of, of consumer recruitment and delivery can be quite high if it's not done right. But from a fixed cost point of view, it's much, much lower. You know, you can get a Shopify website and set it up yourself in, someone did it in 24 hours. Um, and what is that, that has done is it's um, opened the floodgates uh, for new startups, but also for brands and, and retailers from all around the world. You know, we have people like AliExpress from China selling into the UK market. Um, and, and so every, every, everyone's got a website and everyone is, is supplying into the market. Now, when I was preparing this and I looked up my old brand, which used to be the number one brand in the UK, um, I went through 20 pages of Google and I couldn't find it. So, you know, it's been swamped. Um, it's no longer, I believe we used to have like 90% awareness. Uh, certainly that's not the case now. And to stand out in that massive com competitive world is very, very difficult. Uh, huge number of players and economic theory suggests that if you have perfect competition, you're going to have much lower prices and you're going to have much lower margins, which of course is, is what we've seen. Uh, second shift is from ignorance to perfect knowledge. So if we think back 20 years, probably some of you are not 20, but if I think back 20 years to how consumers got knowledge about products, most of that knowledge, they didn't know much about products. Um, their choice was limited to a few stores near where they lived. And if they wanted to find out about price, they had to actually go and visit the stores and, or phone up and, and get specific information about prices or products. A lot of the information they got on products was actually from the producers themselves. It was from the brands and the retailers who of course were not neutral parties. They were trying to flog the product to people. So um, consumers were, were, were very dependent actually on producers to tell them about products. And um, you know, brand image was created as much by what producers could uh, afford to tell you about their product as it was by the product itself. It was quite common to have products that actually weren't particularly interesting or good products, very average products, but with fantastic brand images and people bought them. Um, now we've now shifted to uh, a situation with which many of you have grown up, which is what I would call very close to perfect knowledge um, about products. So if you want to research a product category now, you've got endless resources online. You've got the opinions of your friends on social media. You've got endless user reviews on Google and, and, and on, on um, Amazon, which will give you a pretty objective uh, view on, on that product. You've got myriads of influencers who will, who will review products. And of course, you know, many of these websites like Amazon have got very, very sophisticated price comparison engines. So as soon as you click on one product, they'll tell you what the, the price of 100 other products is. So you no longer have to drive around in your car and collect all the prices of, of the stores near you. You know, it's all laid out for you. So that's a situation of perfect knowledge. And perfect knowledge is one of the characteristics in economic theory of perfect competition. So consumers having perfect knowledge enhances the, the, the perfectly competitive nature of this market. And these days, you know, those mediocre brands or those brands with average products have no hiding place on the web because they're going to get exposed. And conversely, new brands can pop up from nowhere and, uh, and acquire tremendous um, uh, cachet simply by having excellent user reviews. In fact, the whole Amazon um, machine is, is, is based initially when you launch a new product, it's based on how many user reviews you get. So if you get more user reviews and higher reviews, you go up the, the rankings. But if you get poor reviews or no reviews, you sink down. It's nothing to do with the fact you've been there 100 years or, or that you know, you've got statues to your founder in the town square. It doesn't make any difference because your product is just alone and naked facing all these other products. And the consumers can be merciless. And of course, if they have bad experiences with your product or service, they can spread it virally. So brands are now extremely vulnerable to, and consumers are, are all powerful, which brings me on to the third shift, which is it's a shift from push to pull. So in the industry that I grew up in, uh, the factories would churn out lots of standardized product. We do a bit of research and, uh, and then once we knew how to press consumers buttons, we'd fill the pipeline, fill the stores with product. And then we press the big 
advertising button and mass advertising would go out and consumers would pretty obediently, like so many Pavlov's dogs, show up in stores and buy them. It was a pretty crude system, but it actually worked. And we weren't particularly interested in personalizing the product. In fact, it would have messed up the factories if we had. So um, we didn't really care. As brands, we didn't know the consumers anyway because they dealt with the retailers. But um, it was a very uh, disconnected type of system. And it was a producer-dominated system. We, we used to push the buttons and make it all happen. So that's a push system. Now, obviously, with all the, the level of competition, the producer's position is much weaker. And the consumers, as we've seen, have great knowledge and uh, have a lot of power in the system. So coincidentally, um, manufacturing has become more flexible as well. So it opens up the possibility of consumers pulling products through the system. Um, we've seen people like Nike starting to personalize their products. So we're going to see a lot more personalization in the future. But really, just to make the point that this is now becoming a consumer dominated pull system uh, rather than a push system. Linked to this, um, because of the ability of the web to link uh, producers directly to consumers without the need uh, for intermediaries like brands and distributors and wholesalers and retailers, we're seeing long supply chains collapse down to short supply chains. So the old classic brand retail model, you had factories selling to brands, brands might sell to distributors or wholesalers and then they distribute them to retailers and then the retailers sold them to the consumer. So that's a long uh, pipeline. And um, at each stage, the product price was marked up. Um, and for example, factories would produce products, brands would stamp their names on them and double the price, sell them to retailers who just put them in stores, it didn't change the product at all, just put it in a store. And again, they double the price or more than double the price. So you ended up with products and being seven, six, seven, eight times uh, the price in stores to what they actually cost to produce. Um, so you might say, why, why did consumers buy such expensive products? Well, as we've seen, they had no choice. That was the only way they could buy products in those days. But these days, uh, the fact that you can get direct consumer brands that buy directly from factories or even factories themselves setting up their own brands or producers setting up their own brands and selling them directly to consumers over websites with a very potentially very light fixed cost structure, you've got a much shorter uh, supply chain. Um, and obviously uh, um, brands are able to go direct to, cons to consumer, even big brands like Nike now uh, is starting to cut out ret uh, lesser retailers and started to go direct to consumers. They now have over 20% of their business uh, direct online. They've got another, I think 20 or 30% through their own stores. So the bit, their exposure to third parties and intermediary retailers is getting less and less every day. And conversely, we're starting to see retailers cutting out brands and going direct to factories um, and doing more private label. They've always done private label, but they're doing more and more of it. So everywhere we look, people are trying to shorten supply chains in order to uh, cut cost out and speed up the process. And of course, we've got all the cost of the intermediaries, the fixed cost, but we also have a lot of stock because the old pipeline was a very long pipeline and you know we used to fill it up with stock to the gunnels and then start the advertising but if we got it wrong and the product didn't sell the pipeline used to take ages to clear so it was very wasteful in terms of inventory and, and stores themselves are very wasteful in terms of inventory in the sense that say you have 100 stores you put your product range in 100 different places whereas if you were a web, a web company supplying that same market you you might have one or two distribution centers um so is a very not only a very expensive system the old system but it was very stock expensive as well um linked to all these things we've got another another shift which is the shift from uh, a transactional uh process to a more relationship-based process so um while retailers you know controlled the you know corner of the high street that they built um and brands controlled people's mindsets through their advertising from a supplier point of view, you really didn't have to do that much more than just get your product there into the stores in front of the consumer. And all you cared about was selling it. You didn't really care who the consumers were, whether they were new or old consumers or you know, how often they bought from you before. Um, so long as it shifted, so long as it moved out the door, that created a space for the factory to make another one. 
So that's a very transactional approach. And as I say, I mean, brands and retailers used to talk about quality and they used to talk about having nice designs and things. But in reality, so long as the product sold, that was all right. Um, we've now shifted to uh, a very different approach because as we've seen in that brave new world of the internet, if you go down, if you just continue to go down that transactional approach, that transactional route, you're gonna be out there in the swamp with millions and millions and millions and millions of other suppliers selling what is essentially a commodity product. And we all know what economic theory indicates is gonna be the driver of that, which is price. So good luck with that. If you're a big incumbent retailer in the UK or a big incumbent brand in the UK, good luck with trying to compete on in a commodity market based on price with everyone in the world, because you're not gonna be the low cost producer, let me, let me tell you. So it's no longer enough. And those that, that did um, you know, uh, very much cling to that transactional approach, like you know, the Searses or the uh, you know, JC Penney's in the US have basically gone bust. Um, and the ones that survived, the incumbents that survived, have moved, have had to move to a more relationship-based approach. Um, and indeed, many of the disruptors, the disruptor brands, direct to consumer brands have founded their whole business ethic from the very beginning on creating a relationship based approach with their brand community. And a more interactive relationship between the brand and, and, and its consumers, um, because in a, in a time of perfect consumer knowledge and perfect competition, the only thing that gives you any protection at all to your prices or your margins or your profitability is to somehow create a kind of walled garden uh, protected by individual one-to-one -one relationships with, you, with your consumers, whereby you please them and you engage with them in a way that is better than other people. So that's the shift from transactional to relationship. Now, obviously very closely linked to this, we've got the shift from mass to personalized marketing. So I've already described the old brand retail model whereby we used mass marketing. And we had no real, no, no, not really no knowledge of individual consumer behavior. These days, um, of course, when we used to do marketing, we used to do marketing in a different medium from where the sale used to take place because the, the marketing used to take place in magazines or on TV or on posters and the sales used to take place in stores. So it was actually a disconnected system. Um, the great thing about the online marketing and sales system is it's one highly integrated data system. So um, the advertising takes place essentially in the same medium as the sale. You can go into Facebook, uh, be served an ad, engage with it, like it, click on it, go to the website, check out, you've bought it, and you've stayed within one medium, which is basically usually your mobile phone. So there's much less of a disconnect these days. And along with that fact that it's happening all in one medium, every aspect is traceable every move on that transactional journey on that marketing and transactional journey is recorded so facebook is very good at recording how all of their all of their members behave they know a huge amount about them and 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 they know how they're behaving in real time and they know how many of them are going through clicking through into individual brands and and the brands themselves uh, they share that information with brands in real time it's most amazing to see uh, how that you can see how your ads are, are working with different target demographics um, in real time um, and then clicking through and then how many of them converting into sales. It's an amazing feat. And it makes one realize that, you know, in the old days, we were really flying blind. We just used to throw the marketing money at the wall and hope that it stuck. Whereas now you can really see whether it's working or not. And you can even see, you know, by what they call top of funnel middle of funnel and bottom of funnel. Uh, in other words, um, people who've, who are new to your brand, people who've engaged with you before but not bought, and people who've bought before. So you, you can see how those audiences are responding. You might have 20 ads, and you can see how each of the 20 are, 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 are kicking in, in terms of click-throughs and sales. And if they're not, then of course you can retire that ad and put another one in. So you know it is an incredibly sophisticated process, um, incredibly measurable. And it's very personalized. You actually see how individual customers are behaving and it's uh, most remarkable. Um, 
I guess linked to, to what we were talking about earlier, um, uh, we are seeing um, a shift from a sales driven process to more of a purpose driven process. So, um, as I said earlier, the concern really in the old days was just flogging stuff. It was just moving stuff through the pipeline. And as we've seen, that's not enough. We've talked about the fact that it's moved to uh, a more relationship based uh, model. But there's another aspect to it, which also helps with the relationship, which is the concept of purpose or higher purpose. Um, for younger consumers, which you are, um, uh, Generation Z, I'm guessing, or you're the slightly older, but still quite young compared with me, millennials, um, it is no longer enough just to flog stuff. You've got to have some kind of purpose, whether that be sustainability, organic, healthy, whether it's to do with you know, helping starving communities in Africa, there's got to be something more than just selling a commodity product. Um, and also for those generations as employees, um, just flogging stuff doesn't motivate people anymore. So having a, a higher purpose unites the brand and the brand team and the user community, the, the, the um, consumer community in a shared purpose, which motivates all of them. Um, and there's a lot of evidence that being purpose driven is a huge differentiator between success and failure these days. Many of the direct consumer brands have started by having a purpose in mind. So brands like Warby Parker, the eyewear company, direct consumer, icon that's now worth $3 billion uh, valuation, um, started by, um, if you bought a pair of their glasses, they basically donated uh, a pair. Um, we have people like Everlane, the clothing company, who uh, have really invested very strongly in, in, in protecting the people in the factories in the Far East. Um, you've got people like San Francisco Bay Coffee Company that the whole management teams uh, decamped to the coffee growing areas for their vacations for a month and build schools and hospitals. Um, <clears throat> you've got people like Rafa in, in cycling, whose higher goal is to, is to make uh, cycling the most popular sp sport in, in the UK and <clears throat> or world. And indeed, the whole sales team goes out cycling together. Um, they have their stores with their free coffee for the, for the mem members and they sponsor, uh, they sponsor the the British cycling team when they won three Tour de France's. So their real obsession is with cycling, racing, etc. And they just sell some stuff on the side of that. Um, so there are many, many examples of this. There's also examples among incumbents. I mean, Unilever has done some amazing work with sustainability and their sustainable brands are now outperforming their other brands. Um, people like Best Buy in the US are going into households and putting in, they're talking about enriching people's lives through technology and they're going into old people's homes and putting in security systems and putting in protection systems that enable old people to stay in their homes for longer. So we've got some fantastic higher purpose work going on uh, in the world. And that is what is uh, proving to motivate consumers. Of course, linked to all of this, we've got uh, the shift, which is probably the most obvious shift from stores to multi-channel. Um, and from a reliance on physical stores as the only way of reaching consumers to a multi-channel system where online and retail channels complement each other. And I probably don't need to tell you too much about this because I'm sure you will know about this and you've studied this. The only insight I'd like to add into this is that many people talk about multi-channel as if every channel was equal. Um, and actually they're not. Uh, the different channels are good for different things. And that's a very important insight because it helps you design both channels to make the most of what they can do. So let's start off with online. If you're just talking about transacting, the pure process of getting goods from factories to consumers, um, online, it's my belief, online is a much more efficient transactional system. Uh, why is that? Well, the first thing is if you ever got, tried to go into a big store and find something, it's not easy. When you go online, you get these useful things called search engines that will take you straight to the product that you need. Uh, then try and find out information about uh, that product, often lacking in stores. Um, online, it tends to be very fulsome and very well laid out and very consistently laid out. So you can see all the product details very, very clearly and the prices. And you can compare prices. Um, you can also, as we mentioned, you know, you can get user reviews, which helps you make a decision, all of which is very efficient. 
then we come to the, the issue of out of stocks. So having, as I said earlier, having these uh, products out in 100 stores was never good for stocks. Uh, and in the US, 15% of all sales are lost through being out of stock in stores. Um, and uh, online, however, you can have much fewer um, stock depots with a much higher, and also, of course, in stores, the stock is vulnerable to being stolen. Um, and online, it's much more secure. So when you go online, typically, you'll find that they're in stock and they'll be able to ship it to you. Um, and therefore, from an in-stock point of view, it's, it's more efficient. Um, uh, and then, you know, added to that, you've got all the things that we referred to earlier, which is that, you know, all the data about every customer transaction is there online. You know, um, it's difficult to get that data in store, not impossible, it can, it's increasingly possible, but historically, it wasn't very easy to get it in the store. So from the producer point of view, online is fantastic for that for transactional efficiency because you can see all the history of this consumer and you can figure out how to remarket to them very, very efficiently using personalized marketing and using data algorithms um, to analyze their, their, their information. So there are many, many, many areas. I mean, we've talked about the, um, or we will talk about the choice. Uh, you can have massively more choice online. It's much less expensive to put products online than it is to put them in stores. Um, so there are many, many areas and of course, you know, let's not neglect the fact that it's delivered straight to your door and therefore you don't have to go and park somewhere and, and or lug the product back with you uh, in heavy shopping bags. So in many, many, many ways, both for producers and consumers, online is a fantastic transactional, fantastically efficient transactional medium. Um, so is there any role for stores? We ask ourselves, well, yes. Um, and it's interesting that um, Many of the direct consumer brands that started off um, uh, saying they'd never open stores, um, they didn't need them, are now opening stores. And the reason for that is because stores are a great way of interacting with your customer brand community um, and um, meeting them face to face and demonstrating your product and its qualities. And um, it's fantastic potentially, although most stores are not used for this at the moment but they can be used or could be used for creating great brand theater um, to, to really enhance the image. I mean, probably one of the best people for that is, is, is someone like Nike, which really makes their stores very theatrical. Um, and to educate the consumer about the product and its uh, provenance, where it comes from, how it's made. Some people even put um, little production units in the store so people can see how it's made. It's all interesting. I mean, people pay to go to museums and art galleries, so why shouldn't people be interested in getting educated about products? It's a great place uh, for to celebrate the brand community, although brand community is also very strong online, but it's a great thing. Um, Rafa has this great idea of calling their stores clubhouses. Uh, they have the, the Rafa Cycling Club and uh, they, they, call, they call their stores clubhouses. And I was talking to the marketing director at Rafa the other day and she came in from Burberry and she said, when I first got there, I couldn't understand why half the store was a, was a coffee house um, when it only generated 5% of the sales. Uh, but after three weeks, I realized uh, 80% of Rafa's sales are actually online, but the whole thing is driven by the cycling crowd gathering in the stores, having coffee there, having a bun, planning their trips, talking to the Rafa people. Uh, Rafa also helps plan trips, et cetera. You know, it, it's, where, it's where the community, the heart of that community is. Um, and it drives a lot of sales online. Um, and then lastly, but of course not least, intelligent human service because there's one thing the the internet can't do and that is provide that in really that intelligent human interaction not the low level staff which we'll talk about later but the but the highly intelligent uh, uh, stylist type personal shopper type staff who can uh, can help you with the product so that is what stores are great at and in fact the online companies have found that the cost of customer acquisition new customer acquisition through pop-up stores is lower than the cost of new customer acquisition online. So that shows you how much more effective um, and opening a store in an area massively enhances the online sales in that area. There's a company called Showfields in New York and they did a, a test with a brand. Uh, that brand didn't have a store in New York. So they went into Showfields, which offers pop-up spaces. And although they didn't sell very much in, in the pop-up space, they found that 80% of their sales in the New York area um, were, were, the first contact with the brand was through the Showfield store. So um, stores are a great way of driving online sales. 
shift number nine is from disintegrated customer data systems to integrated ones. Historically, the store side of the business and the online side of the business were very uh, separate. The stores were very jealous of their data. Uh, Toys R Us in the United States went bust uh, with over 20 million uh, 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 people in their uh, customer um, card system of which they had only managed to migrate 3 million of them into their online business, which made up under 10% of the business. So if they had migrated those 20 million people, they could have gone on trading even if they closed all their stores because they'd have had a big online business. But the, the stores people were very jealous of that data and they wouldn't give it to the online people. They wouldn't, they wouldn't mix it. So, you know, disintegrated systems, store point of sale systems, internet data systems, not at all put together. So we're seeing that now um, retailers have finally realized they need to integrate their system. For example, the M&S has just created a new version of their Marks, uh, their, their Sparks um, uh, uh, customer loyalty scheme, which is now going to unify all the data across their stores, across uh, MarksDispensers.com and Ocado, which of course they recently part acquired. Um, so they're creating systems uh, with a unified view of the individual customer. Uh, very important. Um, the lady at Rafa told me that um, they had that one of the, one of their most interesting customers in San Francisco used to come to the store every day and drink coffee, but never bought anything. When they integrated their web and store systems, they found that he was the biggest customer in the Bay Area, uh, but he did it all online. Um, so imagine trying to market to that customer if you didn't know that it was the same customer. Um, and then linked to that, having the inventory. So. What a lot of retailers and brands are doing now is they're treating the inventory in their internet warehouses and their stores as being one inventory and they're shipping from whichever is the is the most efficient um, uh, to customers whether it's to the home or whether it's um, through the store or whether it's uh, uh, you know buy online and pick up in store etc they're just you they've got one view of their inventory rather than having separate inventories talking about choice um, uh, a definition of choice um, the old one was what was based on what we used to call the four walls of the store. In other words, how much can you fit in the store? And of course, um, one of the um, uh, things that drove the development of huge big box, big box stores was, you know, the desire to add, um, you know, more products. However, unfortunately, um, there is no big box store in the world that could compete with the end, endless aisle of the web. Um, uh, it's very cheap to add product on the web. Um, and of course, you know, at its height, Sears, which was the biggest department store group in the world, used to have 4 million products. Amazon has 350 million products. Uh, so it just shows you how much, you know, uh, choice is, is online dwarfs what you can put in a store. Um, and that is being enhanced because Amazon a few years ago and, and increasingly other retailers are realizing they don't even need to own stock of those products. They can just create a platform and have somebody else deal with the fulfillment. So that is called market placing. And it is transforming the amount of product that people, Marks and Spencers have started it, Next have started doing it, Walmart are doing it. All the retailers are starting to add lots of third-party products where they they never touch the stock. Uh, they just take the, they just book the sale. And critically, as you build these ranges, you are realizing you do not you do not have to, nor can you possibly physically represent all these products in inventory in the stores. Uh, it was quite funny because AliExpress recently opened in Paris and Ali AliExpress has over 100 million products, um, the Chinese, Chinese website. And when they launched in Paris, they opened a 400 meter pop-up store. And I think that, you know, obviously that just really illustrates the absurdity of trying to represent all of that, all those 100 million products in one small store. So what's the store there for? It's there to engage with customers and persuade the very picky French that this is not some cheap, cheap Chinese rubbish, but actually is really good stuff. Um, and linked to that insight, the move from big box stores to compact stores, retailers are finally coming to the realization they do not need these huge stores in order to interact with consumers. They can have their huge store online and have much smaller compact stores um, uh, physically. And, uh, so the old model, of course, big box stores crammed the ceiling with inventory, um, not much room space wise or cost wise for much customer service. What I call glorified warehouses on the high street or in the malls. Of course, the problem is if you have a warehouse, you put it in a cheap 
industrial. Having these glorified warehouses in very, very high rent locations was obviously a problem. And if you want to look for one reason why, one single reason why they all went bust, that's the biggest single reason. Their stores were just too expensive. They were too big and too expensive. Now people are realizing that they can move to much more compact stores. And we see this with IKEA, uh, with IKEA doing it. Uh, we've got uh, Nordstrom's in the States opening Nordstrom's local. Um, I recently read that Dixon's car phone are, are looking to move to smaller stores. Almost no big retailer is opening any more huge box stores. They may open city center flagships to do brand theater, but very few people are adopting the Sears model and opening up 200,000 square foot stores crammed with inventory. They are closing those stores or being forced to close those stores through bankruptcy, but they're not opening them. And therefore, as the store gets more compact with lower, lower rents and lower costs, uh, there's less room for inventory. And lo and behold, people are starting to use high resolution screens and online video to demonstrate products rather than having them physically represented in the stores. And that's working fine. And within this restricted space, it's being repurposed away from holding inventory and towards the things we talked about earlier, brand theater, education, community creation, and comfortable and luxurious customer service areas. The next shift is the shift in the retail property market from a retail system, property system based on expensive fit outs, long leases and permanent locations uh, to one based on plug and play spaces. So the old retail model was that you had to build a store, you'd put it on your balance sheet, the cost of it on your balance sheet for seven years or 10 years and amortize it. So you didn't want to have the risk of losing that location. And from, from the, the malls and, and landlords point of view, they loved having these seven, 10, 15 year leases. It gave them great predictability. They could borrow money against it. Um, and uh, so everyone loved the long lease model, but unfortunately it is obsolete. Um, and um, part of the reason why it's obsolete is that retailers and brands no longer need permanent locations because they have a permanent location and that permanent location is online. And therefore it doesn't necessarily make sense to have uh, permanent locations. Retailers can't afford very long leases. They're moving towards turnover rents and shorter leases. Um, and as we see that, we haven't fully seen this yet, but I predict that we are going to see the growth of what I call plug and play spaces, which are much smaller, uh, modular spaces with a lot of technology in them where brands can rotate in and out very, very quickly. Uh, and, you know, screen based branding, um, screen, but you know, walls covered with screens, windows made of screens where you can put the marketing chip in and flip the brand from Nike to, uh, to, um, Marks and Spencer's in one minute, uh, uh, put the product in, um, I also believe that, that staff will start to be owned by the, uh, by the landlords. They'll have high level staff that, because a lot of online brands and, and brands don't understand how to run staff retail operations uh, with all the systems and problems that they have. And therefore, if they're only gonna come in for three months or six months to do a effectively like a store pop-up marketing campaign, then they're, they're not gonna wanna know about employing people and then having to fire them after, uh, after a few months. So, this is not fully played out yet, but I believe it will happen in the future that a lot of those resources will shift to the landlord. <coughs> and linked to that, already referred to it, a move from permanent stores used for repeat transactions to pop-up stores used as customer recruitment points, potentially moving regularly from one location to another to maximize brand reach. Because if all you're trying to do is recruit new customers so that you can service the repeat business through your web store, it doesn't necessarily, if you've been in King's Cross Mall for, for six months, probably all the people commuting on that route have seen your store. And if they haven't come in, they're not going to. So it might make sense to move it after six months and have it be in Paddington. Um, it's just a thought. It hasn't happened yet, but I believe it may well happen in the future. Um, and the permanent brand location where customers can come back and buy the product again will be online. And then based on all of this, if we see... Uh, uh, you know, more flexible leases and, and shorter leases and more brands rotating through, we have the potential to go from the low excitement high streets and malls filled with the same boring 20 or 30 brands that we've all known, grown up with, <coughs> uh, 
uh, same all over the country, same all over the world, um, with unchanging brand lineups to shopping areas characterized by a high rate of new brand innovation and changeover. Driving a really good thing, and this is where I really believe in the, the retail revival, driving consumer excitement and engagement. And lastly, as I'm running out of time, the shift in, in staff from doing basic administrative staff to be uh, jobs to being high level stylists focused on creating great consumer experiences. And many of the basic tasks having been automated or eliminated, such as checkout, inventory management. If we move to having less inventory, uh, then that automatically reduces most shop staff's work by about 50%. And of course, cash management, because we're all going contactless. So those are the 15 shifts. Final slide, your young people, you might think about starting out. Maybe you'll, you'll advise your new employers in a few years time what to do, or maybe, who knows, you may start your own brand or, or, or shop. What should that look like to leave you with one final slide? It should be. This is what works now. It's been proven over and over again. It should be purpose driven. Start with the purpose in mind. You should look at this as curating a category on behalf of a passionate community. So what you start with is you start off by finding a group or something that people are passionate about. It's nothing to do with you. You've got to find people who are passionate about this product category or potentially passionate. If it's a low engagement category, I wouldn't advise going into it. <clears throat> And your job is not like in the old days to sort of come up with a whiz bang idea and then push it at these people. Your job is to act as a servant of the community, of the category, of the, of the community, to curate that category for them. So imagine a group of friends in a room who all love seafood or something. And one of them goes, I know, I'll set up a little business so we can all get great seafood. What do you want? What do you want? And what, how should it be? Should it be organic, et cetera, et cetera? That is the way to think of it. It's more like an open source software where your customers and your team can mess around with it. It's not something you control tightly. It's not just yours, it's theirs. An interactive relationship with the community driving innovation. So you've got to be constantly interacting and asking them what they want and get them to test the product. That's what drives innovation in a lot of these successful brands. And linked to that personalized performance marketing, you've got to know how your customers are uh, responding to your marketing and your products and, and, and deal with them on a personalized basis. Correct channel balance. You'll probably start out online, most people do. If you do do stores, make sure they're compact and make sure that you focus them on brand theatre, education, community and intelligent service rather than being glorified warehouses full of stock that you can perfectly well have on your website. Remember that the main job these days, the hard bit is not to get people to buy things. That, I can sit here while I'm talking to you now and buy something on Amazon. Buying things is not the hard thing. It's convincing people about your brand. So don't focus on selling things, focus on creating that relationship. Unified stock and uh, customer data systems from day one don't have disintegrated systems and strong in-store technology for customer tracking and automation. That is what I believe it makes the perfect brand for the next five to 10 years. Um, and so with that, thought I will say thank you and in the 10 minutes remaining open up the floor to any questions. Thank you very much Mark that was uh, very insightful and some really um, yeah great uh, points that you shared there for um, for all of us. Um, we've got a mixture of attendees some that have been around for more than 20 years you referred to 20 years ago and then also our student demographic that is perhaps um, more recently coming into to fashion retail and understanding fashion. So the floor is now open up to, to questions. Um, we have got a couple of questions coming in already. So um, first questions come in um, is asking if you could give a little bit of uh, clarification or maybe an example of uh, a retailer going straight to the factories and leaving brands out of the supply chain. So perhaps you could just explain a little bit more what, what you actually meant by that. Well, that's just a rather sort of a fancy way of talking about private label, um, <clears throat> which I think we all know about. Uh, and in the fashion industry, it's not a particularly new thing because the fashion industry went towards private label a long time ago, except in the more luxury area of the market. Um, but, um, you know, uh, examples in other sectors are people like, uh, well, a, a good example in the US is uh, Target, which um, has massively expanded its own private label 
uh, offering and is doing extremely well with that. Um, and, um, you know, the whole reason why Marks and Spencer's has not collapsed, you know, as, you know, House of Fraser did mm. or Debenhams did is because they've got such a high proportion of their own private label. So private label offers a, a high degree of protection to the retailer. Um, as products become commoditized online and brands become commoditized online, it gives them a uniqueness. And of course it takes a big gouge out of the cost structure uh, and enables you know, people to, uh, retailers to get products uh, but more, more cheaply. Although I think that the emphasis within private label is shifting now away from just doing the sort of volume bottom end bit um, towards producing more sophisticated private label offerings again, linked to this idea of engaging uh, with the community and, and, and really giving people what they really want, uh, as opposed to um, just trying to flog them the cheapest possible product. Thank you. And then um, a, a question just on buying and merchandising. So um, how, how do you think buying and merchandising, the roles of buying and merchandising will change as a result of this new generation of retail? Do you think there will be changes? And if so, what would they be? Um, well, the buying function for a retailer isn't, is, I mean, it's still going to be the, the function of going out and finding interesting products. Um, so uh, that may not change as much, but I think it may change towards being more um, integrated with marketing, this personalized marketing and interacting with the community because I think the old system whereby, you know, you ran the numbers from last season and went and bought more of that, you know, that's not really engaging with the consumer. I mean, it engages with the consumers in the sense that you see what the consumers are buying, but it doesn't really engage with them emotionally, nor does it really, you're not getting direct consumer feedback as to what they want to see. And I think the great brands in these areas <coughs> are ones that really um, engage with consumers and find out what consumers want next and get ideas by sharing sharing together so I, if i were running a retail buying thing i would have them meet with consumers a lot more i'd have a lot a lot of focus groups with, with consumers than in the past in terms of merchandising uh, in many ways the move to online makes merchandising's jobs easier mm -hmm. because you're moving away from having rather poor um brand or store data um and and then spreading your stock over so many points uh, towards a much more integrated centralized stock system and, and having all your data be real time online. So it ought to be easier to run merchandising in the new world. But of course, it's really, really important, as I said, fundamental to have one inventory system and one customer data system so that you know where your inventory is at any given time and, and be able and have it be really accurate because if you use it to ship online or if you use stores, for example, to ship online orders, you better be sure your store inventory is accurate, which historically it never was. So you have to be much more ruthless. <clears throat> and what a number of people are doing in the States now, this is something that uh, uh, Best Buy is doing, is they're actually devoting more of their store space to being online shipment warehouses. So they're making front of store, in some ways, this is against what I said earlier, but it's, they're giving, making front of small slightly smaller. But what the re reason they're doing that is because they want to protect the inventory and have the inventory be common for selling in the store or, or, or ship to the consumer or do, you know, buy online and, and, and pick up in store. So they're using back of house to, to, to hold the stock and then front of house probably has less stock um, and more brand theater, et cetera. To create that security so having one stock system is really really important in this sort of brave new world just on that best buy example you could almost argue that argos was ahead of its time <laughs> i actually think that argos was ahead of its time yeah i think i think unfortunately the thing that really let down argos was the front of house if argos had had a magnificent front of house it could have succeeded but it but yeah. its front of house was absolutely horrible yeah yeah just lots of uh books to flick through. Um, we have a question. Um, so uh, thank you for the really interesting talk. Um, this is about the idea of property developers employing their own sales staff and using this kind of pop in pop out kind of uh, system that you were talking plug in plug out. And um, the question is, do you know of anyone who's already exploring this? Opportunity? Yes. 
Yeah. Um, the people who are exploring it, at the, well, there are some of the big um, property groups exploring it, but the best people are some entrepreneurs that have set up um, sort of intermediary spaces that sort of lease the big space and then subdivide it. So the best one, in my view, in the States is, is a company called Showfields in New York. Um, and they, they, they've got a great model, um, which isn't, isn't just about the, the pop-up concept. It's got far more to it. Uh, than that but they are uh, they have brand ambassadors um so brands can come in for three or six months uh, it's a beautiful environment it's all direct consumer brands that have never been in a physical space before so it's it's there's a real focus on high levels of innovation and purpose-driven brands and they put about 40 or 50 of these brands together in one space they curate waves of this what they call um uh, uh shows uh which are five to six month periods where they'll go with a slightly different mix of brands and they link a lot of um, theatrical type events to it and community-based events to it. So um, they've got a great model, but yeah, they're, they're doing it. Um, they have brand ambassadors who are like ex out of work actors and actresses who are, who are, you know, um, very high level, very uh, charismatic people who, you know, the brand comes in, they, they've got technology spaces and the brand comes in and switches it all on uh, briefs the staff and then they're up and running and selling. So you've got no downtime. Uh, there's another company called Neighborhood Goods <clears throat> does the same thing. And some of the big American property groups like uh, Simon Properties and um, uh, <clears throat> um, oh, what's the other one called? Um, anyway, there's a couple of the big groups. They've got, there's a concept called Brand Box, which is essentially a, like a pop-up section within one of their malls. Uh, which has got small spaces and lots of technology and kind of short leases. So yeah, it's beginning to happen. Um, my view is why will, why will, why it will happen. It'll have to happen because um, the old leasing model of sort of 10, 15 years with permanent retail anchors, the retail anchors are going under. There aren't enough retail anchors to fill the space. What you've got is you've got a bunch of slow moving retailers that used to be the basis for all of their property models going bust. And that's not going to get replicated in the future. Uh, and then you've got a huge amount of innovation and dynamism online with all these direct consumer startup brands that would love to have retail spaces, but can't afford it under the old long lease model. So you put those two together, you've got property, property owners are going to be empty. They're going to be going bust. In fact, they're already going bust. Into in, in the UK went bust. Um, and CBL and uh, Pennsylvania Realty just went bust in the US. Um, and most of the big retail property groups in the States in, and in the UK, Hammerson in the UK, British Land, their sh share prices are all bumping along the bottom. You know, there's no there's no investor belief in retail property at the moment. So they've got to do something and, and probably a lot of them will go bust. But then that space will be available. And I think some bright spark is going to figure out that if you if you design it a different way, oh, albeit you've got upfront costs, you can actually charge more for it per month. And you can access, but you've got that flexibility. So, so the brands are not having to commit to very, very long, um, very large amounts of cash. So, you know, if it's done right, um, they've got access to those hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of direct consumer brands, startup brands, and that can fill their space. So I think they're going to have to go that route. And I don't think the direct consumer brands are going to want to know about hiring staff and learning about shop rotors and clock, clock in, clock out systems. I mean, why would they? Yeah, you need to make it as simple as possible. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're running a little bit short on time, but uh, perhaps just one more question. Um, so uh, what advice do you offer for those traditional retailers or brands with legacy systems? Um, we well, know implement, implementing a new Omni system takes a lot of investment, know-how and time. Um, that is, this is why we've seen many traditional retailers going bust. But for those that are still in business, what advice do you offer them? Well, it's really, it's, it's the lessons that come out of the 15 shifts, you know, and the point is <clears throat> you, you, you've you got to, I mean, look, for a lot of the retailers, they sat on their hands for so long that by the time the wave hit them, they were gone. There was nothing they could have done. I don't believe that, you know, someone like Debenhams or House of Fraser could have been saved, you know, because by the time, by the time uh, the wave hit, you know, by the time they got to 2017, 18, it had gone too far and trying to flip their systems, their, their, their model would have been too hard. <clears throat> the ones that are succeeding are the ones that saw the early, early warning 
things between like 2014 and about 2018 and started. I mean, Nike on the brand side started quite early on going towards direct. Um, uh, Best Buy started in about 2014. Target started in like 2016 or 17. Um, you know, and, and in the UK, we have some, you know, people like, you know, John Lewis, for example, you know, they, they, they've got substantial amount of their business online. So they, they actually moved early. Next, you know, X, Next was run by the Wolfsons, who, who, are, who are, of course, a mail order family. Um, and um, the, if anyone understands the online model, it's the mail order people, because mail order was online before we had online. Um, a lot of the same things applied to mail order. So the Wolfsons came in and they built a huge online business in Next. Next now it's over 50% of their business, which is why they haven't gone bust. You know, mm -hmm. their stores are going down just as hard as the as the other people's stores, but they, they've got huge online growth. So there's some really good players. Um, you know, for for the UK, I think as I say, if you've got a high portion of private label and you've managed to build a bit of an online system, you've got the chance to enact all of the kind of things that I talked about, which is, you know, you've got to come up with a purpose. You've got to sit down. I, with some of your team and ideally with a bunch of loyal customers because again you've got to have the data you why don't if you've got the data why don't you pull your 100 best customers in the uk and put them in put them in a luxury hotel for the day and have your team and you sit down with them and talk about things like what should the purpose of the business be what should we be doing you know from a, a giving back point of view because it's more than just about selling you know what do they want to see in terms of product what do they want to see in terms of services go through the whole thing it's got, it's got to become an interactive relationship. Um, you know, I would say to any retailer or brand out there, even if you haven't got great data, pick up the phone and start calling customers and talk to them. Mm -hmm. Ask them simple questions. Were they happy with the last thing they bought? Very few people ever do that. Don't be afraid to start in, uh, interacting with customers because customers love it. They may not always give you what you want to hear because they may tell you that you're rubbish or something or they don't like you. But I think a lot of retailers and brands are, are actually scared to talk to their customers. They're, they're shy and they need to sit down with them and get out there and start figuring out what those customers actually need. I'll give you a great example. CVS, the pharmacy group in the States, they were basically flogging pharmacy drugstore type items like all the other drugstores in the world. There was a little bit of interaction over prescriptions, but that was about it. They come up with this brilliant idea called Health Hub. And Health Hub is, is you go walk into a CVS and there's an area which is like a service area where they sit down and talk to you about your health. Now, given the parlous state of the American health industry with insurance and all of that, yeah. the American consumers love that and they're offering that advice for free. And they started offering low level services. Again, very, very, very competitive rates. So they started offering people diabetes testing, uh, uh, weight management, um, uh, COVID, they're doing COVID inoculations. Yeah. All of the basic things, um, you know, um, uh, people with like joint problems, you know, and they've started dealing with the whole family. So what someone comes in, they have these care concierges who interact, who are quite charismatic people. And they ask them about their families and the other medical conditions of the families. They're drawing the consumer in. It becomes a relationship. And now they're looking after their health. Because when you go into the, the, into the pharmacy, right, you may think you're going in there to buy a toothpaste or something. But when you go into a pharmacy, what you're actually desiring is health. Mm. Not desiring toothpaste or pills or whatever what you really want the underlying need is health and so they have to start providing health and they've actually shifted a lot of their products around because they realized that they were very short of serious bits of medical kit that people needed like knee braces and stuff like that and they crammed the stores with crisps and peanuts and and sweets and everything like that so they pulled all that out and they put that on screens you can still order it online on screen if you want it but now they've got the things that people really need the things that differentiate them from from other pharmacies um, and they've got a two-way relationship going. So that's, that's the whole thing. The, the consumer's need state stretches far beyond what most retailers are giving them, you know? I mean, like with Best Buy, it was, it was, it was that Best Buy has a deal whereby you can have all of the technology in your house, all of the electronics in your house looked after by Best Buy, whether it's bought from Best Buy or not. And that gets rid of your problem whereby, you know, your internet, you know, your, 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 your Netflix doesn't work. Is it your TV? Is it your, is it your online? You know, is it your connector? Is it your phone? What is it that's not working? There's a lot of multiple technologies involved in a lot of these things. And what Best Buy says is we'll just solve all of it. So you pay a fixed fee. And I think the fee is like, it's like a couple of hundred dollars a year. 
which is nothing compared with the call out rates for, as we know, in the UK, for, you know, technical people to help you with these issues. But it puts their technical people in the home where they can see what the consumer needs, what other things, oh, you don't have, you know, you don't have this, you don't have that. I mean, you know, they start to form a relationship and pretty soon they're building the business. Um, so those are the kind of things that, that you need to do. And it can be very simple. Yeah, so engaging with your customer and listening to your customer, which I think yeah. what we don't do. Yeah. So thank you very much, Mark. Um, you've given up time and your sort of busy schedule of frantically trying to get this second book that you're writing completed. Um, I think you mentioned it's something along the lines, you haven't got a title yet, but maybe you could just give us a couple of words um, about the book because it very much relates to the talk you've given today. Well, the first book, Retail Therapy, was uh, came out in 2019. It was really a summary uh, of all the events up to that date, and it was quite big picture. It talked about the retail apocalypse and, and some of the things retailers and brands might be able to do. So it covered some of this ground. Um, then, so just as soon as that was published, we then had COVID. So the publishers came back to me and said, look, we think COVID changes everything. Why don't you do another book? Um, and so this book's called Retail Recovery, which, of course, is a bit of a optimistic title for where we are right now but it's based on the idea that things finally got so bad with covid that everyone woke up and that there was this kind of reset moment as this as their beloved stores were actually physically closed which had never happened even during wars and revolutions the retailers finally woke up and are starting to change which we can actually see but it's also a much more detailed book because i've spent the intervening retail therapy was really written in 2016-17 it took ages to get published so things have moved on a lot and I've been studying for the last four or five years what's actually been working and I've made some distinctions based, which is really what I've just presented to you in, in the presentation about this is really based on what people are actually doing and this is why they're actually surviving and thriving. Some of the brands, you know, we've got brands out there and retailers out there that are doing plus 60, 70% in the middle of COVID. Now, why is that? Mm. If you look at the common factors, it's these 15, it's these 15 shifts. Yeah, I think often we hear we hear bad news, don't we? You know, we're often led to believe that, you know, COVID has been a disaster and that everybody, everybody's, you know, struggling. But there are actually some there are actually some businesses out there that are doing phenomenally well and are reaping the rewards of, uh, of COVID. So absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, Mark, thank you very, very much. We really appreciate your time and your insights. Uh, we do have more questions. I'm afraid we don't have a chance to answer them all today. Um, lots of thanks within the chat. I don't know if you've you've clocked that mark, but yeah, lots of comments and, and thanks and praise for your talk. So thank you very much. And the the talk has been recorded and will a link to the recording will be circulated. So those of you that have missed perhaps some of the content, then please do take time to catch up on the recording. So Mark, thank you very much. And um, yeah, enjoy the rest of rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. And look forward to seeing you all next week for our next Fashion Means Business Fashion Talk. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Take care. See you. Bye-bye.